want to talk to you about God. Who is this God? You are praising somebody right now. Do you know who that is? You may have a glimpse or a small idea, but the question of the hour today is really to go beyond that which is sinful and truly ask yourself, do you know who this God is? That question was asked and has been asked through all generations. In the Bible, we have several illustrations where people, for different reasons, asked, Who is this God? It was a psalmist who cried out and said, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the sea and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek him. Thy face, Jacob. This is David giving God's resume. He's introducing this God of his that he knows. And his purpose, the premise, the premise behind him saying that is to encourage someone to say, well, who are you talking about exactly? He continues to say in verse 7 of Psalm 24, Lift up your heads, or gates, and be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory, that the King of glory, that the King of glory may come in. And here it comes. That question. Who is this King of glory? Who is this king of glory? I'll tell you who it is. The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates. And lift them up. O you ancient doors, the king of glory may come in. Again. The question of the hour. Who is this king of glory? The Lord almighty, he is the king of glory. He speaks as he gives his resume, wanting to entice the hearts of those who are listening. And this is exactly what you and I are supposed to be doing every day of our lives, enticing and motivating everybody whom we talk to, that they might ask that question, who is this king of glory? Others ask this question almost as a rebuttal, as a rebuttal. Look like a ventriloquist, don't I? I should have gone a puppet in. But they ask as a rebuttal in a refusal to receive or to accept that there is such a God. We have it in Exodus 5 and 2 where Pharaoh said, Who is this Lord? Who is this God you're talking about that I should obey him and let Israel go? And there's people in this world today, as you shout out, who is the Lord? Who is this God? They say to you, who, man? Where? I don't see him. I don't touch him. I don't feel him. I can't put him in a box. I can't weigh him. I can't box him. I can't. A refusal to accept that there would indeed exist such a mighty God, the King of glory. And others in the Bible in amazement. As they saw him visibly perform great humanly impossible things, controlling the elements. They couldn't wrap their minds around what they had just seen. 
And the only thing that would come out of their mouth was this. Who is this God? Who is him? Mark 4 and 41, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? And even the waves obey him. People have always asked, who is this God? And for different, <clears throat> for different reasons. As I said, some to exclaim his marvelous works, others amazed that they can't wrap their head around who, how great this God is. Another says, ah, who is this God in a taunting manner? question for us this morning as we continue forward I ask you have you ever asked yourself who is this God do you really ever take time in the seriousness of your day that moment you take for yourself and sit down and ask yourself who is this God that I profess to know him you ever go home after church and after you shouted and sang and jumped up and did that Christian two-step and enjoyed the service and then go home and say, what was that all about? Why did I do all that? I get off of this pulpit sometime after screaming your ears off and I go home and I go, wow, what a service. Did you see how people were shouting and worshiping the Lord? Such a joy. And, and I'm, who is this God? It's incredible, amazing. Does he not amaze you anymore? Isn't he incredible? Who is this king of glory that I've come to call savior, that I've come to know, to see him work in my lives in ways I could never imagine? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because we hope to find out a little bit more about him. As I said, and as I began this morning, it was several years ago, probably 25 years ago, that I said to myself here at Rocket Ages while we were at the gymnasium, that I would uh, do a series on the five books of the Pentateuch. And I did indeed put a series together, and I said, I'll finish in about a couple of months, and I'll teach the people for this and the other, and God will be good, and we'll have a greater knowledge of God's word. And as I told you, it was five years later that we were very close in the book of Exodus. And so I cannot promise you that this will take us a week or two. It may take us till Jesus comes, but I'm going to do my best to express to you and to share with you just a little bit of sinful knowledge, but yet life-deliberating, life-changing knowledge of whom the Lord is. Who is this God? The book of Exodus is one of my favorite books always because I believe that next to the New Testament books that we find, the book of Romans, those books that we call the full gospel, in the Old Testament, to me, the full gospel is found in the book of Exodus. Because in that book of Exodus, we mostly learn about God. And we see how he deals with his people, how he responds to their actions, what he's able to do for them in his love, and how crucial he looks at their mistakes we see the deliberating acts of God to set his people free. And we see where the Lord somehow even turns his face. Knowing that character is so important in the lives of those that will follow him. But it's a perfect book. If you've never read it, you need to read it. You'll find other things I cannot express to you. One commentator said concerning Exodus, is it an epic tale of fire, sand, wind, and water? It's incredible in this book that you find things about God that you need to know. 
And as I told you, I'm going to say this, and even though it's monotonous, until you begin to know the God you worship, everything you do in his name will validate. Prayer will begin to mean something when you know who it is. Worship will begin to mean something when you know who it is. Your offerings, your talents, the gifts, all these things, the sacrifices you offer will begin to value when you know who it is that you're doing it for. And God wants us to know him. God didn't come to establish the assemblies of God. Didn't come to establish the Catholic Church, the Baptist, the Anglican Church, whoever. He came to establish a relationship with us. And this is where you'll find him, heart to heart. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 says, this is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast in their wisdom, or the strong boast in their strength, or the rich boast in their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me. So you see how important that question is? Who is this God? Don't ever ask that question unless you want to know. Because God, when you say, you say or you mention that question, God listens, are you really wanting to know? Because it's his greatest desire that we come to the understanding of, of knowing him. And he goes on to give you help, a head start. He says, I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For in this thing I delight. It's important to ask, who is this God? But never ask flippantly. Ask seriously because he wants you to know. The book of Exodus, ladies and gentlemen, I trust that maybe you're starting to read on it a little bit. It introduces us into the lives of two groups of people, two nations to be exact. One is the nation of Israel that's sitting out day and night for the past 400 years almost. The hot suns of the deserts of Egypt and then we have Egypt itself, and both ruled by two different men, as we will learn. One by Moses, who was called to deliver this people of Israel. And then we have on the other side Pharaoh, the enslaving villain, the oppressor, the antagonist of God's people. If you'll read the book of Exodus, I, I, I have to embellish and continue this even if it takes more time to tell you how beautiful it is because if you read it, every scene you read about is a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece. Do you understand that? Yes? Help me. Yes? Okay. Somebody say, what? It's a masterpiece. The baby in the basket. The burning brush. The river of blood and the other plagues. The angel of death. The crossing of the sea. The manna in the wilderness. The water from the rock. Thunder and lightning on the mountain. The Ten Commandments. The pillar of cloud by day. And the pillar of fire by night. The golden calf. The glory in the tabernacle. And once you read the stories, they're never to be forgotten. Never. In this book, for the Jews, it's a story that defines their very existence. This is the greatest picture of God's relationship with them. And it's the beginning, the commencing step of their journeys in the Lord. For them, it means everything. It means everything for them. And for us as Christians... We should take a love for this book 
Because it's this gospel, this Old Testament gospel where we see the first acts of redemption on behalf of our God and Savior. When we return again to the book of Exodus, we find, and as we return to the book of Exodus, we'll find really, if you'll read it, that there is something of significance for the whole entire human race, for all of us. And every verse in this scripture gives the captive hope of freedom. It gives us hope of freedom in the Lord. It shows us that God is able to deliver his people. So here's this God. I've got a few minutes to finish. And I want to at least finish this this morning. Well, in Exodus chapter 1 and 2, you'll find that it answers this first question when you ask, who is this God? You'll find that he is the protector and the fulfiller of his promise. It may not sound like divine revelation to many of us because you've heard that before. But I'll tell you what. When you're praying over somebody and the threat goes beyond your reach of health, you're going to want to depend on somebody who is faithful. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. It may sound something like you, you might want to gloss over that simple truth. Oh, he's a fulfiller of promise. He's faithful to protect. That may not mean nothing, but when you're laying on a gurney and you're getting ready for a liver transplant, when you're laying in a gurney when your family, your baby is sick and hooked up in the ICU, you want to believe in somebody who's able to keep a promise. Hallelujah. Somebody who gave you a word. And not only willing, but capable of keeping his word. He's a promise keeper. I said he's a promise keeper. This is how God reveals himself in these first two chapters. Let me just read a little bit just for context. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob. Each with his family. And he mentions the family. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers, he goes on to say, the generation died with the Israelites exceedingly fruitful. They were exceedingly fruitful. And they multiplied greatly, increased their numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. If you go back to the book of, Ex, uh, to the book of Genesis a little bit and read the final chapters of that, you'll find out that we see the journey and we see the whole experience of Joseph and how his brothers took him out and gave him away, couldn't kill him, and ultimately gave him off and sold him off as a slave. And we find the journeys of Joseph. And, and those of you who know his story know that the Bible continues to tell us that God was with him. His brothers got, got jealous, and I'll just paraphrase. Because God had his finger on that young boy and gave him a dream, gave him a vision, gave him a future, spoke to him about his destiny. And he went and he mentioned his dreams to his brothers and even his father. And the Bible says that while his father looked at him and kind of like, hmm, really, boy, his brothers got jealous and got angry. And they could not accept the whole idea that the youngest of all would be the greatest of all. Tell you what, you can ruin a good dream when you tell the wrong people. Come on, somebody. You want to ruin your dream, you go tell somebody who's not a dreamer, who doesn't believe in God speaking to his people. And so you know the story and how they planned to kill him and they took him out and Ended up deciding that none of them had the guts, the guts to, to kill him. So they throw him in a dry well and they planned the whole thing out to send the robe of many colors back to his father. They couldn't kill him. So the older one said, we can't kill this kid and he's our brother. So they saw a caravan of Egyptians asking why. He said, let's just give this guy out and sell him. That way we're free from his blood. 
And that's exactly what they do when they, he takes off and trying to be quick here with a lift. <laughs> but we see how the Bible says that God was with him even in the fit all the way to Egypt. And at Egypt, he finds favor. And he gets into the big things. God takes him out of the pit and brings him into the palace. Only to be attacked by the enemy in the palace through Potiphar's wife. You remember that, anybody? They put him in jail. And he holds all these things. And you know what the guy with the wine, and the cup holder, and the bread maker. You know, all these things. You'll read about it. Read the Bible. Man, some of you are looking like, What? You'll hear, read Harry Potter, but you won't read the Bible. I'm smiling. I'm not scolding you. But read the Bible. At the end, by the time we catch up to them in Exodus, we find that everybody is out. But the last few verses will tell us that God was with Joseph. And he ended up coming back. And he was a great mathematician or something, great economy guy. And he fixed the economy in Egypt, learned how to store, because there was a great famine. He was an interpreter of dreams even. And Pharaoh found favor in him because it was a good thing that he was able to save Egypt. And because of that, all the surrounding tribes began to come into Egypt because that's where the food was. But Joseph had died, and the Bible says in the book of Exodus that there came another Pharaoh. This is important. That knew not Joseph. Hmm? That means that all the celebrity of Pharaoh was God. These people were rolling. They were growing, multiplying, and everything else because of what Joseph, God through Joseph had done in the previous years. He set them in a good place. And so it was almost commitment of Pharaoh to take care of these people because they were producing and doing great things, but they were growing. But then this guy died off and somebody else came in who didn't care means about this Joseph they heard about. I don't care about this old Joseph. I'm the man now. So all of his celebrity died away. And then we get to the book of Exodus. Where trouble begins. And the Bible says that this man, and I'm just paraphrasing, read it. This, began, this man began to punish the people, to chastise them, and to oppress them. So what does this have to do with this whole thing? The simple fact that God had made a promise before all of this happened. And now there was a Pharaoh in the way. And I'll tell you what, any time you go through something like this, and there's a Pharaoh in your way. <laughs> nobody's listening to me this morning. I said, nobody's listening to me this morning. I said, when you have a promise before this, that said, I want to bless you. I told you a couple of weeks ago when I was at the hospital in Houston, while I, was, I had double pneumonia, that bacterial pneumonia, that God spoke to me in the middle of the night. He said, I want to get you out of here, and I'm going to bless you. And then you wake up on Sunday morning, and you look at your face, and you go, what the heck? Where's the blessing? Is this the blessing? The promise I received was before this Pharaoh. Oh, church, I wish I had a Pentecostal church in this house today. I am telling you, do you understand what I'm saying? You were told something good before. You didn't, have, you didn't know about the Jericho that was in front of you. Didn't know that one day all the luster of your fame and glory and your good relationship and everything, shiny and all, the momentum was going to be stopped dead. By a pharaoh. So what happens to their promise? Lord? You said you're going to bless me. I can't move my tongue. I can't blink my eyes. I can't drink or swallow. Did I misinterpret something? I'm not going to stand behind the pulpit. This is my, 
He said, my call in life, I'm a speaker. I talk to people daily. I'm a voice walks to heaven. I'm a herald of truth. Now I have nothing. But he who makes that promise is faithful. And if you have received a promise, if there's anything else I can say because time is passing, that you received a promise and you finally met a Pharaoh that doesn't care beans about what they told you, it does not change the promise. It doesn't matter. I preached to you a sermon a while back. I may bring back just to wet your lips again. Your thing, your thing will never change the promise. And so we find these people here having lived great because they were living on the momentum of something great before this. But all of a sudden, here comes this man in the way. He said, well, Joseph said we should be treated right. I don't care who this Joseph is, man. Well, we only work till five. Well, you work until one in the morning now. Well, we used to stop to eat for an hour. Well, now you've got 15 minutes. Scoff that sandwich up your throat and get to work. You think that the rooms amongst the hearts of the people weren't saying, man, what happened? What happened? Man, this is going to be tough now. How are we going to survive this? You ask yourself when you're going through something, oh my God, they just laid me off. The economy is getting worse. Gas is at four or five dollars a gallon now. Look at all this political junk going on. What now? Remember the promise. Remember the promise. Remember what he said. He is faithful to protect and to keep. I give you homework to go and read Exodus 1, verse 8 through 22. And we'll talk about that next week. But I want your heart to begin to boil because we cannot overlook this fact. We see a list of names in this particular chapter. The sons of Jacob. But they were gone. And now we see a hurting people wondering that the legacy they had prayed over and believed and the future they were hoping to embrace was falling apart like sand through their hands. Didn't matter if Joseph was an important man anymore. What matter now is what God had said. We're going to get to the point, and I know some of us have been there before. We've had pharaohs like this before. That it's not going to matter what the doctor said. I was told three times that I would die by my medical physicians when I was had my cirrhosis. And I shared that with some of my intimate friends here at church. And you are deaf to what I said. You are deaf. You said you will live and I die. Why? Because you love me. Because you've known me all these years. Because I'm a nice guy now. Nice guys die all the time. Yes? But because you promised. And he promised he will protect you and keep you until he fulfills that promise. The Bible says that the Lord is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. Every word that he speaks, he will fulfill. And I'm here to tell you, as I close this morning, 
this is a running thing. I'm not closing this sermon. I'm closing for the moment. But you're going to get to the point where you're going to have to believe this one truth. That the promise you got before the storm is still the promise alive and well. And that promise itself, because it's fulfilled by the will, the purpose, the power, the anointing, the blood, the throne of his authority, it's sustained by that. It will be fulfilled. You will see what he has promised, the Bible says. The Bible says he is able to keep that which he has promised. And this is what we begin to learn this morning in this book of Exodus. And even though this devil Pharaoh came to work, then the Bible says ruthlessly. Some of them may have gotten a little bit dismayed. But there was someone in the house who said, no, 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 no. God said he would. Turn around and tell your neighbor this morning, God said he would. Tell your neighbor, God said he would. Hallelujah. God said he would. It's incredible that in this book you you want to find about how the people dealt with their government. And trust me, we are dealing with ours today. We see here the first, actually the first picture of civil disobedience amongst these people. As they saw the government come over them and press them down. But the important thing tonight is not to talk politics. This morning is not to talk politics, but to talk about his power. And how is able, ladies and gentlemen, to bless you, to keep you, to prosper you, to repel you, and to keep you. Until every word he has spoken on your behalf be fulfilled. How many believe that this morning? I ask you, who is this God? And in simple terms, I want you to write this down somewhere. He's my protector and the fulfiller of his promise. And you'll put it on your refrigerator, write it at work on your desk. I don't care what you do, but you put it somewhere you can read it in the morning in your car. He is your protector and the fulfiller of his every promise, even before the storm. Would you stand to your feet? I don't know what it is that you're going through this morning. I don't know where you're standing right now. Maybe you're just in a joyful high because everything was going good, but all of a sudden you were introduced to some pharaoh in your life that doesn't care a scene that completely ignore the joy you had before you got to that storm. I'm here to tell you, pay no mind to that pharaoh. He's just a bump on the road. The promises of God will come to find you because he has set them to follow you. To follow you. This is why the Bible tells us that the blessings of the Lord follow us daily because God seeks them and directs them and they find their recipients.